для советского народа это была Великая Отечественная война. Он вел ее во имя свободы и независимости своей социалистической родины, во имя избавления Европы, да и всего мира от фашистского порабощения. 20 миллионов жизней советских людей унесла эта война. Наш народ не забудет ее никогда. Леонид Ильич Брежнев. I'm Bert Lancaster. On the 8th of October, 1941, the war between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia had been underway for almost four months. On that day, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, broadcast from Berlin that Moscow had fallen. Hitler's troops, he said, could see the Kremlin towers from their front lines. Another four or five days, and the swastika flag would fly over the Kremlin. Germany believed these reports, so did many others. After all, Hitler had conquered Western Europe. He had blitzed London. But here in this area, some 16 miles from the Kremlin, and commemorated by these symbolic anti-tank obstacles, the Nazi blitzkrieg came to an end. Here in the Moscow suburbs, the Red Army and hundreds of thousands of ordinary men, women and children threw up barriers which the Nazi tanks could not crack. Here the tide was turned in the unknown war on the Eastern Front. On November 7th, as always, the Soviet Union celebrated its national holiday. Stalin addressed the troops in Red Square and then watched as Red Army units paraded past him through the snow and onto the front. In early December, the Red Army counterattacked. They pushed back Hitler's armies as far as 125 miles from Moscow. It was the first time in the Second World War that the mighty Nazi Wehrmacht was stopped. Our story, the battle for Moscow. Moscow, the heart of Russia. Moscow, where modern Russia began, where Vladimir Lenin lived and worked and planned the development of the Soviet state and where his body lies for eternity. The Kremlin, the nerve center of the Soviet Union. From here, the Stavka, the Soviet high command, directed the unknown war. In 1941, its bright towers and gold onion domes were daubed with gray-green paint, camouflage against the Nazi bombers. Anti-aircraft guns put up a barrage from the roof of the Moscow Hotel. In the summer of 1941, Moscow took on the look of war. On June 22nd, Hitler had launched Operation Barbarossa with the intention of annihilating the Soviet Union, occupying the motherland of Russia, and exterminating her people. It was to be an epic battle. But the people of Moscow, sending their husbands, sons, and brothers to the front, still hoped that the war would be a short one. Life in Moscow had been normal. 
people were thinking about their vacations, enjoying the welcome warmth of the summer. Bolshoi was completing its season with the great ballerina Ulanova dancing. Suddenly, all that changed. By mid-July, the Wehrmacht had already covered half the distance to Moscow, Hitler's prime target. The Nazis were jubilant. In less than a month following the road Napoleon had taken, they had come within striking distance of Smolensk, 235 miles west of Moscow. Systematically, they isolated unit after unit of the Red Army. They thought the war would be a short one. Vienna, Prague, Brussels, The Hague, Copenhagen. Oslo, Paris, Belgrade, Warsaw, lay behind them. Moscow would be next. the first serious air raids came to Moscow and with them a growing awareness of danger. More anti-aircraft guns were mounted and the defenses were dug, the women alongside the men. At small ends, the Red Army was fighting with all its strength to protect Moscow. Some German tank crews were attacked so furiously that they could not open their turret hatches. Even Hitler was forced to acknowledge what he called the savage determination of the Russian infantry. The battle in and around Smolensk itself lasted 10 weeks. 10 Soviet divisions were caught in the Smolensk pocket. They made the Germans fight for every city block. Of it destroyed, Smolensk was in German hands by the beginning of September. Its defense had bought time, but at fearful cost to the Red Army. At the end of the month, the German High Command assessed the total Russian losses over all the front at two and a half million men, 22,000 guns, 18,000 tanks, and 12,000 aircraft. Almost exactly the figures for the total Russian strength the Nazis had thought they would have to face and to overcome to win the war. German intelligence had blundered. The Russians were fighting as hard as ever, and Moscow was still over 200 miles away. By now, the air assault on Moscow had begun in earnest, delivered by the same squadrons that had bombed London, Liverpool, Warsaw, Rotterdam, and Belgrade.
The Moscow subway system, one of the most spacious in the world, became a shelter for hundreds of thousands of ordinary Moscovites. At the Kirov station, deep below ground, the Russian general staff set up its new offices, working on while the battle continued in the night sky. In the first month of their raids on Moscow, the Nazis lost 200 of their bomber pilots. While below, the children grew accustomed to this new way of life and made a game of it. did not seriously interrupt Moscow's industries. Most of the capital's plants had already switched to armaments. Despite the heavier raids of August and September, their output increased. They rushed it straight to the front. Occasionally, there was heavy damage by fire as well as by high explosives. The attack was indiscriminate. It even damaged the embassies of Germany's allies, Italy and Japan. Often the Soviet fighters scrambled and the siren sounded. Moscow's landmarks began to suffer. Moscow University, the famous Vaktanga Theater, the Prague Restaurant, and even the Kremlin suffered minimal damage from a bomb. And it gave Moscow's children a new hobby, collecting souvenirs, bomb fragments made in Germany. As far as possible, the Muscovites lived their lives as usual. From time to time, they woke to find fresh evidence of the night's activities. Each morning, they stood in line for news from the front. It was not encouraging. The Nazis were very far from being contained. In September, the Fuhrer decided to intervene in person. At the German field headquarters, he unveiled his new plan. Moscow must be surrounded in such a way that not a man, woman, or child could escape. Then the city was to be flooded. Hitler ordered, a huge sea must conceal the Russian capital from the civilized world. Hitler christened it Operation Typhoon. Along a front of 150 miles, Operation Typhoon committed 74 divisions, 14 of them panzers, and 8 motorized. 1,800,000 men, 1,700 tanks, over 14,000 guns and mortars, and nearly 1,400 aircraft. To face them, the Red Army had 800,000 men, with 7,600 guns, 990 tanks, and 670 planes. On September 30th, Hitler declared, after three and a half months of fighting, you have created the necessary conditions to strike the last vigorous blows which should break the enemy on the threshold of winter. And once more, the Wehrmacht lumbered dangerously eastwards. 
toward Moscow. Three days after the start of their attack, the Nazis claimed a breakthrough in the center. On the fourth day, they took Orel without pausing. They had pinned down major Soviet forces in one pocket near Vazma and another near Bransk. Goebbels announced, the annihilation of this army group has definitely brought the war to a close. The encircled Soviet divisions fought on. Their fierce resistance slowed the Nazi pincers and allowed the Soviet high command to make a fighting withdrawal of the rest of its troops. North and south, however, the Nazis were still grinding towards Moscow. It was the hour of decision. Early in October, Stalin summoned General Zhukov to Moscow from his Leningrad command intending to place him in command of the Western Front protecting Moscow. That front was beginning to crumble away. Zhukov recalls those days. I arrived in Moscow on the evening of October 7th and immediately went to Stalin's apartment in the Kremlin. He had the flu, but he was working. He greeted me with a nod and pointed to the map in front of him. Look at the front, he said. I can't get an exact report on what's happening, where the enemy is, where our troops are. If you can, go straight to Western Front headquarters and study the situation there. Call me any time, day or night. I'll be waiting. The situation on the Western Front was very dangerous. Practically all the roads to Moscow were open. It was the most critical moment of the entire war and Moscow was preparing for the worst. The diplomatic corps had left, and so had many of the government officers. Stalin and the Stavka stayed. Whole factories were now moved to the east by train. Zhukov left Moscow at once to assess the situation at the front. New defense lines were formed in the area of Mozhaisk. Stalin appointed Zhukov to command on October 10th. The mood in Moscow was somber. People were listening to news of the heavy losses at Vyazma and Bryansk. With the Nazis only 40 miles away, the Muscovites could hear the distant thunder of the battle line. Stalin proclaimed a state of siege. The Moscow Communist Party called on everyone to defend the city. Six hundred thousand Muscovites, old and young together, turned out to strengthen the city's defenses. Most of Moscow's manpower volunteered for the workers' battalions. The new infantry, hastily trained, was to march out at once against the Nazi veterans. The poet, 
Olat Okunjava, a combat veteran himself, sings this song about the street where he was born, now defended by the Muscovites. <laughs> И затемнение улицы одела, Ты обучи любви арбат, А дальше, дальше наше дело, Ты обучи любви арбат, А дальше, дальше наше дело. Расписки с винтовки с нас взяли писаря, но долю себе выбрали мы сами. Прощай, Москва, душа твоя Всегда, всегда прибудет с нами. Прощай, Москва, душа твоя Всегда, всегда прибудет с нами. Прощай, Москва, душа твоя Всегда, всегда прибудет с нами By now the Nazi panzers were in trouble. Soviet resistance was stiffening all the time and rain and sleet turned the country roads to mud. Goebbels announced a temporary halt due to weather conditions. On October 20th, Guderian's panzers reached Tula, a hundred miles south of Moscow, but could not take it. Tula defied Guderian. Its troops were reinforced with 4,000 men from the workers' battalions, and it fought on as the panzers bypassed it, racing for Moscow. While the militiamen of Tula prepared to defy the German flood, Guderian's panzers had been attacked by some new Russian tanks, the new T-34s, and they were superior to anything in the German arsenal. Up to this point, Guderian concluded early in October, we had enjoyed tank superiority, but from now on, the situation was reversed. In one area, the German operations map showed obstacles at two military schools. Here, a handful of cadets, young boys, stood against the weight of the Wehrmacht, expecting only to delay the enemy for as long as they could. They succeeded, at the cost of their lives. the Red Army could delay the Nazis, the more time to regroup and resupply. The Soviet strategy was to blunt the Panzer's strength from their fixed positions, build up overwhelming reserves, then counter it. All along the front, Russian units spent themselves against the German army at every crossroad and every village. One small unit had only 28 men left, but it accounted for 50 Nazi tanks. Its commissar was Vasily Klotchkov. Russia is enormous, Klotchkov said, but there's nowhere to retreat because Moscow is behind us. Klotchkov died in the fight, and with him his general, Ivan Panfilov.
upon tens of thousands of Russians died shielding Moscow. They are remembered. Moscow waited. Hitler had promised Mussolini the town will fall without the loss of a single man. Zhukov knew that the Nazis were readying themselves for a final lunge. The German orders for dealing with Moscow were already in print for use by the SS. First, seize the Moscow Communist Party Committee. Then the headquarters of the International Organization of Workers' Aid. then the information services in the militia headquarters at 38 Petrovka Street. And then there would be a Nazi victory parade on November 7th in Red Square, by invitation only. In the middle of October, conditions had been such that Moscow might cease to be an effective seat of government. Stalin and the Politburo stayed to command the defense. In defiance of the German threat, on November 7, the traditional Soviet military parade took place in a light fall of snow. Comrades, Red Army and Red Navy men, officers and political workers, men and women partisans, the whole world is looking upon you as the power capable of destroying the German robber hordes. The enslaved peoples of Europe are looking upon you as their liberators. Be worthy of this great mission. The war you are waging is a war of liberation, a just war. Many of the troops march straight to the front line. Zhukov recalled. Meanwhile, anti-tank defenses were being organized in depth and tank-proof localities being built in threatened areas. Losses were being replaced. Arms and ammunition supplied. From its reserves raised in the rear of the country, General Headquarters reinforced the front with infantry and tank units. From November 1st to November 15th, the Western Front was reinforced with 100,000 men, 300 tanks, and 2,000 pieces of artillery. The ground was as hard as iron, and the cold was becoming cruel. Belatedly, the Germans began preparing for a winter campaign. Hitler arrived to inspect the arrangements. He had ordered a new offensive to begin on November 15th. He had two weeks before the worst of winter was expected.
Clothing came in from all over occupied Europe, like Christmas presents. But it was a propaganda stunt. What Hitler saw was only window dressing. All that arrived was enough to issue one set of winter clothing to every hundred men. Most had only thin denim combat overalls, which they stuffed with newspapers. Some even used German propaganda leaflets, which read, Surrender is the only sensible course, as the issue has finally been decided. December 2nd, in the afternoon, a German column reached Krasnaya Poliana, 16 miles from the center of Moscow. It was as close as any German would come to realizing Hitler's dream. Moscow was now within range of the Nazi heavy artillery. The Germans stayed in Krasnaya Poliana for less than a day. Russian tanks and factory workers fighting as infantry drove them out. Zhukov had planned well. On the night of December 4th, along the whole length of the 200-mile northwestern front outside Moscow, the Red Army went on the offensive with 100 divisions. Within 48 hours, the entire center of the German army was under heavy pressure. The Soviet Supreme Command had released its strategic reserve to Zhukov. They were the divisions from Siberia, fit, strong, fresh, superbly trained. Hitler had ordered no withdrawal, but it was an order impossible to obey. The Nazis' three main battle groups lost contact with each other. Army Group Center came close to panic. On December 6th, Guderian wrote in his journal, all the sacrifices and efforts of our brilliant troops have failed. We have suffered a serious defeat. He retreated a hundred miles in ten days. was winning the first major Soviet victory. North of Moscow, on the Kalinin front, General Konyev orchestrated his formidable artillery. It was a sound as welcome as a victory march. In the first week of December, Hitler conceded that victory could no longer be achieved that year. The 
German defense lines north of Moscow came under savage attack. As General Rokossovsky, commander of the 16th Army, recalled, we realized that victory in this gigantic battle, covering a huge area where troops from nearly three fronts were taking part, would be a turning point in the entire war. Sullenly, the German retreat continued. On December 20th, Guderian, the creator of Germany's armored forces, tried to tell Hitler that his troops were exhausted and overexposed. Hitler called him a coward, and a week later sent him home in disgrace. Another victim of Germany's first defeat on land in the Second World War. At the end of February, the chief of the German general staff reported 112,000 of his men were suffering from frostbite. They were the lucky ones. 202,000 Germans had been killed, 46,000 were missing in action, 725,000 had been wounded. The Nazis no longer fought for an ideal or an ideology for the Fuhrer or the Fatherland. They fought blindly to survive, to get to a warm place. The intensity of the counteroffensive raised the battle to a gigantic scale. Counting both sides, it involved some 3 million men, 2,500 tanks, nearly 2,000 planes, and more than 20,000 guns and mortars. The full force of the Soviet counteroffensive abated without having achieved a deep penetration. But the Red Army continued to savage the Germans through the depth of winter, reducing the Wehrmacht's will as it staggered away from Moscow. Wrecked once by the Nazi advance, the villages were harrowed again by their retreat. The Red Army was welcomed with joy. resume his duties and naturally began with a speech. Once more the Red Army went on its way. The Red Army was advancing into a wasteland of smoke and blackened ruins. The 
Nazis even burned what grain they could not carry. In places, enough for an entire town. But sometimes it could be salvaged. The Germans in retreat destroyed wantonly, leaving a litter of precious things, the souvenirs of a lifetime. The town of Klin, home of the genius of Russian music, Tchaikovsky. The Nazis burned the original score of his sixth symphony. near Poliana, the home of Tolstoy. In this room, Tolstoy wrote War and Peace. The Nazis used it for a barracks. When they left, they set it afire. Then they defiled Tolstoy's grave. Nothing was sacred. If they spared the priest, the Nazis left the sanctuary a charnel house. The Red Army's combat cameramen began to reveal the first evidence of German atrocities and of the agony they caused the survivors. Hitler had called it the new order. It was new, and it was bestial. It treated human beings as if they were mere objects. It reduced people to nothing. The new order valued no lives but German lives. It left the dead anonymous. And annihilated families. The new order degraded whatever it touched and scarred the souls of those who survived it. The battle for Moscow was the Wehrmacht's first major defeat. The Soviets had achieved three things. They had saved their capital. They had shattered the myth of German invincibility forever. And they had shown the world Russia's ability to turn the tide. Russia's allies marveled at her ability to resist. Sir Anthony Eden, Britain's foreign secretary.
Averill Harriman, President Roosevelt's special envoy, had arrived earlier for talks with Stalin. He remembers. And uh, this was in September, late September, early October, 1941. The Germans were at the gates of Moscow, you remember. And the, the many military men thought it was impossible for Moscow to hold out. But Stalin was de de determined, and the Russian people responded. Uh, we had spent four nights with Stalin. We came away convinced that Moscow was hold. For a moment, the Soviets enjoyed a hard-won respite. But Hitler's plans held no comfort. He said, as soon as the weather and the state of the terrain allows, we must seize the initiative again. And through the superiority of German leadership and the German soldier, force our will upon the enemy. In spite of the Red Army's efforts, the Germans were still within striking distance of Moscow. There would be other battles to come, many battles. The unknown war had only just begun. There would be three and a half more years of battles. Next story, the Siege of Leningrad. For 900 days, the people of Leningrad withstood the Nazi army surrounding them. They died by the tens of thousands, of starvation, of bombs, of shells. But they would not surrender. And Leningrad became one of the hero cities of the unknown war. <laughs> 